Hello, I'm Ali Langdon. Welcome to A Current Affair. It's a privilege to be sitting in this chair. Something must change. Domestic violence has become our national shame. Kim O'Reilly is lucky to be alive after being beaten by her then boyfriend. He's now out and she's terrified. This is Kim's story. He threatened me multiple times if I had told the police what he did to me, that he would burn my family. He threatened me a lot. So that's just what I'm afraid of. In many ways, it doesn't end. I don't think I'll ever um, get to live my life from now on. There's no end in sight. Talk me through that because the man who attacked you is now out of jail. I feel let down, I guess. I don't, I think um, as a human being, you don't feel like you mattered or what's happened to you has mattered or what you've suffered has mattered. Um, it's been a real hard and unfortunate situation, but a far too common one. Do you feel safe right now? No, not at all. Not at all. I'm oh, sorry. Don't apologise. This is really hard to talk about. Do you a moment? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Kim O'Reilly is living in fear after she was attacked and left for dead by her then boyfriend, country footballer Jake Frecker. In the early hours of the 17th of January 2019, she was beaten so badly she's been left with permanent injuries. Her screams and cries so loud, neighbours called police. We got a cab back to my house, um, got out of the cab as I stumbled out the driveway, she fell over, I fell as well. She hit the side of her face on the concrete, I just hit my knee. After he was challenged, Frecker changed his story. I do remember um, hitting her once in the bottom half of her face, in the jaw. Yep. How hard did you do? <sighs> I don't know. It wasn't soft. I'm, I'm going to be honest. He initially denied the assault and said, you fell. Yep. When the police arrived, uh, that night, he, um, he pulled me up onto the bed because I couldn't get up onto the bed. Mm -hmm. um, and he grabbed his phone, put it in his pocket and said, tell them that you fell over. And then he threatened me and said, you're going to tell them that you fell over. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And then the police came in and could clearly see that I hadn't fallen over. Um, and that's what breaks my heart, that that's what that you live with now. Yeah. You remember every moment, every second of that night. That night, I will probably go over it a few times a day in my head. I just was so grateful that the neighbours called the police and I just always constantly think about what he would have done if they didn't come. Did the neighbours save your life? Yeah, absolutely. And the police, because they believed me. He broke your eye socket, your teeth, he repeatedly punched you in the face, the eye and the jaw. Did you know until that night that he was capable of such violence? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He'd done many things before that. Yeah. I'm sorry, even sitting here and having to talk about it now, it's bringing a lot of it back, isn't it? Yeah. He would lock me in the garage and, you know, I wouldn't get out till 7am the next morning. He would lock me outside until he fell asleep on the couch and I'd have to jump the neighbour's fence. I'm still struggling every day. I still have panic attacks. I still, you know, have nightmares. I don't sleep. I have anxiety and PTSD, and I didn't have any of this before. After serving less than four years of his six-year sentence, Jake Frecker is now a free man. He's out on parole. How did you find out he'd been granted parole? I got a call from the victim's register at the time 
and my legs just went out underneath me before she could even say anything and I just said, how can this happen? Um, and then she just went through the motions of telling me that he would be released on the 17th of January and I just screamed, how can you do that to me? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the way it's done with a phone call is also very unfair. In a cruel twist, his Freedom Day being the anniversary of the brutal assault. Yeah, that day will always be the day that my life changed forever and my family's, and that will forever be his day that he got freedom mm -hmm. and not the day that he did the wrong thing. Were you consulted in any way ahead of being, him being granted parole? Um, no, so I got the call in December. So you were only informed once the decision had been made? Yeah, nothing before. He was eligible for parole from October and then until December, that's when they made the decision. So it's almost like once again that power is being taken away from you. Yeah, once again we're going through this because of him and to, to keep going through this horrific and controlling event um, where he's just got the power every time is like it's enough, it's enough already. Mm. I think it's just constant disappointment. Kim O'Reilly is calling for change. She wants victims to have a voice at parole hearings so authorities can see firsthand how they're coping. You write the parole board a submission um, and basically in that email, you have to express all of your fears, your concerns, your heartache, not just for yourself, but your family and friends. Um, and I think the disconnect of not having that um, personal conversation, really you lose control over the feeling and the emotion in the email by not having that. You want to be able to look them in the eye and say, this is why I'm still scared of this person and I don't want them out in the community. Yeah, absolutely. I want them to see what I suffer on a day-to-day -day basis mm. over him being released into the community. Mm. It's not about um, punishing him. It's about what I deserve and what my family deserve for going through this. Mm. He goes and he's living his life now back in the community. You almost, in a way, have to always live in, in a shadow or yeah. there's, there's a secrecy around your life now. Yeah, it, it, it will be more intense now about the secrecy. I just, no matter what anyone says to me about his rehabilitation, I know him and mm. I know what he can do and I'm not willing to put myself in that situation where he's able to get to me. He'll be angry at me for what's happened and it'll be my fault still and he won't be satisfied until he gets his revenge. He's just a very revengeful person. So you will hide from him for the rest of your life? Yeah. It's, it's on my mind every day, all the time. A million different, thousands of different things go through my head about, um, you know, the next two years and then what's going to happen after that. How long do I have left to live? What? Yeah. <laughs> what I think about ever since he went in there because I should never have told him what happened. What do you mean you should never have told them? He threatened me multiple times if I had told the police. But you're strong, yeah. you're brave and you're a fighter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely my parents' daughter. Mm. <laughs> but. As hard as it is, I, I'm never going to stop. I feel like this happened to me, to have this responsibility to talk, um, to be loud, and to shine a light on the injustice on women. And, you know, no matter how many tears I cry, I'm not going to stop. Mm. You're pretty amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can't tell you how much it means to me, but also for the people that I'm trying to help. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Kim's strength is just so inspiring. And now to another strong woman campaigning for change. When Hannah Clark and her three children were murdered in 2020, as a country, we vowed never again. But this summer, we've seen far too many women attacked and killed. I spoke to Hannah's mum, Sue, late today from Brisbane. Sue, really appreciate your time. Every one of these attacks must 
just rip at your heart? It does. I, I can't believe it still keeps happening. Mm. It, it should not happen. It, it breaks our heart every time we see this is still going on. No family should be put through this. It's the thing, isn't it? How many times do we say never again? It keeps happening. But you, you saw the coercive control that monster had over Hannah. Kim experienced something similar. What is the most important thing we need to do right now? Right now, I think we need to change the laws. We need to bring coercive control in as a standalone law. Queensland is doing that. New South Wales is doing that. South Australia is talking about it. We need to get Victoria and Western Australia on board because we have to stop this. We have to give the police to stop it before we have these horrific things happening. Mm. The thing is, though, it's not just on or it just can't be on the police and authorities, can it? It's going to take all of us. It certainly does. It's everyone's problem. It's not just the police problem. Mm. We all have a neighbour or a friend that we may see going through this. We need to pull out the perpetrators. We need to call them out and say, that's, this is not how you treat somebody. Mm. And again, we also have to look after the victims and let them know that we hear them, they're validated, and we're there mm. for them when they are ready to leave. But I think this is the problem, Sue, because the whole system lets them down. And you were just listening to, to Kim there. And for these victims to not have a say during the parole process, it is once again these survivors not having any power, not having a voice. Exactly. There's nothing worse. They need to have a voice. It seems to, at the moment to be all for the perpetrator and not for the mm. victim. And we need to change that as well. Mm. Do you have hope, Sue, that we can change things and that one day survivors will be safer? Women, children? Oh, 100%. That's our dream. We don't want one more family to go through what we did. It's been a lot, hasn't it? It certainly has been. It's been a long three years. Mm. And is it tough when you come out and speak tonight like this? Or does it give you hope that people are listening and, and the message is getting out? It's tough. It doesn't get any easier. But it gives us hope that more and more people are talking about coercive control and more people are understanding it. So that gives us hope. Luckily, Sue, there are people like yourself and Kim who are fighting the good fight. Yes. And let's hope we get more and more people to help in that fight. I really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ali. Well, as Sue just touched on for police, domestic violence is one of their top priorities. In New South Wales, have taken a giant leap forward with the high-risk offender teams and crime editor Simon Boda was granted exclusive access. He joins me on the desk. Simon, you've been on the front line with these officers. Ali, I have, and, and I've got to tell you, it's an incredibly complex issue and, can I say, frustrating for the police. Tomorrow, police in New South Wales will outline a massive new operational strategy targeting the most dangerous domestic and family violence offenders. Its code name is AMAROC. It's confrontational and it's in your face law and order. Police will use the same tactics that they've been using to combat bikie gangs, organised crime and terrorism. Ali, it's just a quick preview of tomorrow night's story. Police! Open the door! Five or two copy, thank you. Well, that is in your face uh, policing right there. And you're going to see Simon's special report tomorrow night. And if you or someone you know is experiencing family violence, there is help. Call 1800 Respect. That's 1800 737 732.